Hi there, everyone who's just joined. Uh, we're going to give a few more minutes for people to flow in, but it looks like we've got a pretty good group of people today. Uh, so just a couple more minutes, and then we'll get started. Thanks. Mic check on the YouTube stream. All right, it looks like everybody's here. Um, welcome to the second part of how to implement anti-racism culture in an early stage business or startup with Paige Gillette. Um, she's gonna start in just a moment, so let me switch to the stream of her. Uh, and just to remind everybody, um, this is mostly a lecture, but feel free to ask questions in the comments. Uh, at the end, we'll have a question period, and I'll read out any questions that anybody has. And you don't have to wait until the end of the talk to start asking your questions online. I'll keep track of all the questions everyone's asking, and then ask when we have time for it. So without further ado, welcome Paige Gillette. Hey, thank you. Good, hi everyone. And uh, thanks for coming back for folks who came back. Um, for folks who it's their first time, welcome to part two. Uh, I will be doing a little refresher of what we went through last week, so you won't be too lost, um, but it will most likely speed through the second part. Uh, if you are looking for part one, I believe it's on the YouTube, Uconstruct's YouTube page. Um, and then if not, I'm sure you could find Uconstruct, send them an email and be like, hey, where's part one? Um, showing interest for part one is excellent, but welcome to part two. So we'll get started. Um, yeah. So just in terms of acknowledgement or re-acknowledgement, because we're in part two, um, of course, this workshop uh, has been created and facilitated on the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dan First Nation and Tan Kwachan Council. Uh, and conversation surrounding anti-racism is never easy, um, never really fun. So do take the space that you need to be able to learn. If you're in person and it's getting too heavy, feel free to get up. Just mind the camera um, when you're leaving um, and then for folks who are online feel free to take a break and come back to uh, the full webinar that's going to be on YouTube. A little bit about me, uh, same as last week, but mostly for the people who are new this week. Uh, I'm Haitian, I'm an activist, I'm a feminist. Um, I've been involved in many, many political movements, as you can see, uh, but I'm also part of Northern Voices Rising, which is a newly created collective of uh, queer, trans, BIPOC people here in the territory. Uh, and we're pretty rad. Check us out on Facebook. Uh, check us out on our website, northernvoicesrising.ca. Okay, so I know Rick mentioned it for folks that are online. If you have any questions, um, send your questions. Please do. This is webinar, but I will be able to answer it. Hooray for live 
things. Um, but also for the people in person, uh, we'll go through the people's questions at the webinar first, and then after we will continue on the questions in person. Um, but maybe a five minute break so I can go to the loo and do whatever I need to do <laughs> before going into those questions. <laughs> Okay, so a little refresher from last week. Uh, so last week we went through, uh, you know, we all want to, oh, all right. no problem. Mm -hmm. Good thing I created it. I know where I'm at. We all want to implement um, anti-racism in our business, uh, in our workplace. Um, but first we had to recognize that it starts with you. Right? You can't change a culture if you're not part of the culture. Um, and so we talked about recognizing your own biases. Um, to do that, you need to learn, but you also need to unlearn a lot, a lot of things. Um, and you need to be involved. You need to be involved in your community. Um, you need to be involved uh, in, in supporting communities around you. Uh, we talked about concept to action. So the words and what their meanings are. So we talked about anti-black uh, racism. We talked about anti-racism. We talked about white supremacy and dismantling white supremacy. Um, again, if you need a refresher, check out part one on YouTube. Um, and uh, we, ex we used examples in ways that these words, these big words manifest, um, especially in the business context, uh, and concrete ways to dismantle the bad, bad words. Uh, we finally did a deep dive into internal practice. Um, so when we're talking about human resources, uh, we talked about hiring more racialized people. Um, we did talk about diversity and inclusion and how we really need to use equity when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. Um, and that change needs to happen by implementing internal policies. Uh, we talked about work culture and we talked about calls to action. I actually am so happy to be doing part two this week because last night I was listening to a podcast um, called For the Love of Work and they were talking about inclusion, diversity and what they called belonging. And I was like, oh, that's actually so wicked. That was part one. So if you're a podcast person like me, check it out. Um, for the love of work, it's pretty easy to remember because not everybody loves our work. So for the love of work is what it's called. Um, and so today what we'll do is uh, deep dive into marketing and communications. Um, how does that play out when we're talking about an anti-racist framework? Uh, we'll talk about uh, client and customer engagement. I'm using the words client and customer, but I'm also recognizing that some folks may not have clients. You actually have members and membership. Um, so just so you know, whenever I say client or customer, I also mean membership engagement. Uh, and then we'll talk about this new word that everybody loves called social innovation. Um, but how can you implement social innovation in an anti-racist framework? Okay, this is also really exciting for me because I get so excited when I hear marketing and communications. I'm like, oh, let's get pop culture in there. Uh, but also, what is marketing, you know, in terms of uh, not just finding people and marketing strategy, of course, uh, but it's your branding. It's really who people will get to know um, without actually asking you the questions. Uh, you know, it obviously answers the by who, um, for who, with who, and the what, so your products, um, and the where, which is the location. If you're you, Connor, you probably have it in your logo. We like to show off our fireweed. We love to show off our mountains. Um, but it's pretty obvious that we're talking about the location as well. Uh, but the case is that in terms of marketing, many businesses lack in diversity, um, both in high hiring and in marketing. So uh, of course, when we're looking at their ads, when we're looking at um, you know, how they portray themselves, we see a lot of white people. And which means for me, who's black, uh, it means that this business or this, this organization isn't actually tailored for me and my needs or doesn't see me, um, the infamous I don't see color, uh, doesn't see me for who I am or doesn't see me as valuable. And so a lot of businesses are tailored for white people, we have to say it. Um, when black and racialized people are used, they're often uh, used as tokenizing um, or they're paired with lighter colored or white people. Um, I 
I still remember uh, lotteries uh, ads, especially in Ontario. Um, you know, you're you're always looking at cash for life and Lotto Ontario. And one thing that sticks out to me is that it's always white people winning lottery, as though black people cannot win the lottery, as though racialized people cannot win the lottery, or if they do win their lottery, um, they're in relationships with another white person or a lighter person. Um, so we're talking about colorism. And colorism is really finding that light of shade um, just to say that you're inclusive, but you're not actually inclusive. Uh, and I challenge you to look at any ads um, and see what it's like. Uh, I won't name which government, um, but I've noticed that specifically governments have been starting to, to hop on that train of diversity, uh, including more black people. But if you look at when they include black people, it's usually in a negative of tone. So it'll be like, this government is here to help everybody who has needs for child services or for divorce services or mental health because you are doing so bad. Um, and then you're looking at wellness and healthy and it's white people, senior white people, younger white people, white people with their dogs. Uh, so it's really interesting how racialized people still in this theme and bracket of diversity are being used and what messages are being used. Um, and often the images that we see don't reflect the reality I put the infamous John Travolta meme because that's how I feel whenever I see an organization putting all the black people and then I walk in and I'm like, where are the black people? Where are my people? Um, so it's nice to have that diversity, but if you don't actually reflect the people who you're showing off, um, you're lying. Uh, and that's not okay. Yeah. So, um, in terms of your marketing, I highly encourage you to uh, use all opportunities to show who you are. Uh, last week, we talked about internal policies, uh, mission statements. Uh, you know, I talked about land acknowledgments. I do land acknowledgments um, because I recognize the land and the privilege I have to be on this land that was, um, in some cases, either stolen or because of the resiliency, we need to acknowledge that we're able to live and breathe and do what we can. Uh, I put acknowledgements um, because land acknowledgements aren't the only thing you can acknowledge, right? You absolutely can acknowledge that your building, for example, is not accessible. Uh, you can absolutely acknowledge that you are still learning uh, within your anti-racist framework or mindset. Um, and be mindful of language. So I'll use a couple examples later on, but I know there's a trend of finding language because you want to be hip. Um, and so you'll use language that isn't yours to begin with. Um, I see smiles in the room. I'm sure you see where I'm going, but using language like that's lit. That's awesome, that's la la la. And you're thinking, where did you get, okay, maybe not awesome, everyone uses it, but where did you get lit? Wouldn't it be kind of weird if you construct started saying, hey, we have workshop series and it's gonna be lit. Um, you're not catering to black people because you don't actually include black people. And so when you're using that language, be mindful of where that language comes from, um, but be mindful who uses it and whose culture is it. And it's also important to know that sometimes the language you use is not from your culture and it's not your language to use. Uh, I like to say, if you understand where that language came from, would you feel comfortable, you yourself, saying it in the group in which that culture came from? Um, most of the times, it's I'm speaking to white people and I say, would you feel comfortable saying that same language in a group of black people? And they'll say no. So why would you do it for your business, especially if you don't include us. Um, so you have to be mindful with your language. Of course, the sun is coming, so I'm going to move a bit. Um, but we talked about HR and hiring racialized people. Um, and so, of course, if you start hiring racialized people, you can start using that language, right? Because that's the people who are the create, um, who are the 
the creative minds behind your marketing. Um, and I do want to say, if you're hiring racialized people, include them not just in your marketing in a tokenizing way, right? Look at me, I've hired this diversity. Uh, but we are also creative people. Uh, we are also artists. Ah, yeah, thank you. And we could also come up with ideas. Um, and so you won't have that, that fighting, that constant battle of am I being inclusive in my language if your work is already inclusive itself. Uh, I like to say beware of stock images. I can tell when stock images go on sale because suddenly everybody's talking about diversity and has these images. Uh, as racialized people, we know what stock images look like. Um, and for me, when I see a stock image, I'm like, okay, you are selling me not your product, but you're selling me fakeness. And what you're telling me is you want my money, you want to see me you know, come in and support you, but you don't support me and my existence or my people or my peers. Um, so be aware of stock images and something you can do instead of stock images, you could do a call out um, and say, hey, we're looking for, let's say you're a thrift shop, we're looking for certain people of different sizes, of different ethnicities to come and show off our clothes. Um, you know, ideally you would also give them a discount, that would be nice, or free clothes. Uh, but those are ways that you can contravene the stock image um, funness. I want to talk about allyship um, and performative actions and culture vultures and culture appropriation because those are words that people hear often um, and sometimes they, they'll say hey I'm actually doing what I'm doing is allyship um, but it's actually performative actions. So allyship is the understanding that you are an ally which I personally hate the whole I am an ally. Um, I like to think that allyship is not a person, it's not a brand, even though I'm talking about branding and marketing, um, but it's constant work that you're doing in solidarity. Um, but sometimes, some people, what they'll do is they'll do that one solidarity action and say, hey, look at me, I'm actually supporting you. But then we realize that you've never supported the people you're, you're trying to support. Um, I think one that comes to mind right now is um, the infamous uh, Blackout Tuesday, where we saw a lot of businesses change their profile pictures for the Blackout um, profile picture. Uh, and you know, a lot of us racialized people are going, well, <laughs> isn't that ironic that this person is putting this Blackout Tuesday? How is this profile picture actually going to support the livelihoods of black people? Um, so those are performative actions. And often with performative actions, which I'll go into next, um, you will get called out, right? If you continue a performance, you're continuing a facade, people will call you out and say, this is not okay. Um, oh, go back. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to talk about culture vultures and culture appropriation. Um, so a lot of times I'm seeing people, especially around Halloween, because it's the infamous Halloween time, it's coming up, people will say, I want to support people, um, and so I want to embrace the culture, and for that reason, I will do um, something that's either mimicking the culture, um, because I, I, I support it, I embrace it, I love it. And, you know, culture vultures, the term, uh, as you can hear in terms of vulture, is you're stealing. Right? You're stealing people's creations. You're not giving them the proper, um, the proper acknowledgement. Uh, something that we could see with culture vultures, for example, is TikTok. I'm sure folks that are of the younger generation or have younger youth will know what a TikTok is. Um, and you've seen the call out recently with a lot of young black either uh, youth uh, creating content uh, and then they don't get as much acknowledgement or it's not seen as beautiful as their counterparts that are young white youth. Um, and for that we say, well, that's culture vulture. You didn't actually give credit to the people who, who started it. You just recreated something and claimed it as your own. Uh, culture appropriation is another one, but I want to deep dive in terms of when you're a business owner, um, sometimes you'll see, and there's a huge conversation, especially now happening in Vancouver, where a white woman decided to uh, sell garments 
and sell it in the, I, appro I appreciate, we always hear those words, I appreciate First Nations culture. I decided to create this uh, clothing line for white people, but I didn't want to make it too much like the First Nations art because it would be too much for, for the white people. Uh, so great, great for appropriate, and I say great, obviously I'm, I'm not saying great, um, but <laughs> you're appropriating someone's culture. You have no idea the historical context of where that art came from, only for your own business and your own benefit. That's not okay, and you will get called out for it. So do understand the difference between allyship, performative actions, culture vultures, and culture appropriation. Um, and of course, if you're anti-racist, you have to understand that sometimes the business you're creating might not be the business you should be creating in the first place. And that's a hard pill to swallow for some people. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, of course I can do this. My husband or my wife is so-and-so uh, identity. Um, and I, I want to say, be careful when you're claiming somebody else's identity because you can't claim their experience. Uh, and so when you do get called out, keep in mind that a lot of times when people call you out, it's because not only did you do some of these actions, but you're not actually acting in allyship. You're actually um, further either stere stereotyping their identity um, or you're not um, putting forward what their true experiences are with their own language, right? Um, so just be mindful uh, and by being mindful, don't do it. So I wanted to use a couple examples. Um, I, as a queer woman, love my queer family because we always try to be the most accessible, the most progressive, um, and we often succeed. Uh, so I wanted to give an example of Bricks and Glitter. Uh, this is the splash page to their website. Um, so when you check out Bricks and Glitter, it's the first thing that comes up. Um, and you can see on their website, it says about us, events, land acknowledgement. Um, of course, get involved, fundraising, English, French, etc. cetera. But, um, you know, it, it's really nice to see that there's land acknowledgement because I know right away what I'm dealing with. I know right away who they are. I know that they're inclusive. I can see from their images that they're inclusive. And I, it helps me to believe what I'm seeing because I see that there is a land acknowledgement. If we go to the next one, um, this one is uh, um, one of my friends from Toronto uh, who is a soap maker. Um, and in the about section, uh, she declares exactly what she's about. Um, so she goes into uh, the, the, the land acknowledgement, but she also states what that land acknowledgement means to her and what it means to her business. And I wanted to include that because yes, sometimes you see land acknowledgements and it's kind of brushed under the rug. Um, and sometimes, again, with that performative actions that I was talking about, you wonder, why is there a land acknowledgement? I want to know that when you do a land acknowledgement or any acknowledgement, uh, you truly believe in it, but you also understand the impacts of your land acknowledgement. Um, there's also language that she's using. Um, you'll notice sometimes there's, there's lots of language that we can use. So folks will sometimes have an X, women has an A. Um, on her other uh, page, she'll also write her pronouns, um, she and her. Uh, so again, you know that it's inclusive. Yes, there is the anti-racist framework, but she's also cautious of other oppressions. And she's also saying, okay, I'm not just going to be in solidarity with people um, for their ethnicity, but understanding that that ethnicity has uh, intersectionality, which we went through last week. Yeah, so the infamous call out and call in. Um, I do want to, to spend time on it because it, it's one of my favorites, um, especially as an educator. Um, I. Uh, you know, of course, love to see call outs. I love to see call ins, um, but they do serve their purpose. Um, and often I see people so afraid of acting or so afraid of doing the right things because they don't want to be called out. Um, and as I mentioned last week, you will make mistakes. It is the nature of it. This workshop will probably be old in five years. Right? In five years' time, I'll probably look at it and be like, what was I talking about? We need to change this language. Um, so 
call out, uh, you know, it's uh, being exposed in public. Um, you're being challenged for your behavior, for your actions. Um, and it could be a conversation starter or it can be a conversation continuum. Uh, and sometimes with call outs, what I hope you understand is that racialized people, especially since we're talking about anti-racist framework, racialized people will find ways to call you in before they call you out. Um, and that might look like, you know, hey, can we have a conversation about this? I don't feel comfortable. Or, you know, this is kind of weird to me. Sometimes it's not as obvious because we're not in a position to tell you what you're doing is blatantly wrong. Um, and that means sometimes we can't tell you. We can't go into the colon. Uh, when we talked about diversity and inclusion in the workplace, if you're the one black person who's fearful for your job, you will most likely will not have that conversation with your boss. Um, you will most likely be like, I cannot call you in because I'm not in that position to, to have this conversation. I'm fearing for my work. Um, and so recognize the little signs that comes out with callouts. Um, of course, callouts can be very public. Um, they could be in the news. Uh, they could be on social media. They could be on your Facebook post. Um, you know, sometimes it could be something you have nothing, you didn't see it coming, and some people are like, what just happened? Um, <laughs> sometimes it could be posters around town. Um, you know, you're walking around and you see a poster is being talked about your work of place. Uh, it could also be word of mouth. Um, sometimes it happens that it creates a scandal. Um, and really the whole point of a call out is public shaming, of course, but it's public shaming because it's a call to action. Again, it's that last resort saying, I couldn't get through to you in any other ways possible. And so now shame is gonna be the way you're gonna to have to learn. Um, and so calls to action can act as, uh, or could be seen as a call for change. Right? It could be seen as a boycott, flat out. Do not go and shop at that place because their behavior or their actions don't follow um, their, what, they're, what they're projecting in the public. Um, it could be a firing. <laughs> uh, it could be asking your removal. Um, Call-outs can be very hard when it happens, um, but they are a way of educating people. Then there's the call in. Uh, and often we don't hear conversations around calling in, uh, but I do want to let you know that they exist. Um, and call-ins are usually conversation in private. Uh, they're mostly uh, empathetic. They have a little more um, nurturing tone to them. Um, usually call-ins could be because the person really cares about you and is like, listen, I really need to have this conversation before I have authority. Again, I mentioned with a call out, when you have a staff who's not in that position of authority where equity is not meant, um, it could happen in a call in too, where someone says, I need to bring in that third person who you see as an authority figure so that you understand that I'm not attacking you, but I'm bringing you in, I'm having this conversation for you to realize something is wrong. Um, and of course, with call-ins, there's also um, calls to action. So it's, I like to say, it's the warning before being called out. Um, yeah, so when you're called out, I mean, not everybody got that Olivia Pope money um, to fix the issue, uh, but if you do, good for you, awesome. Um, but if you don't, there are ways that you can address the call out, right? Um, so when you are being called out, it is important for you to address the issue and to apologize. Uh, and often you'll notice if that's your first step to any sort of conflict, um, you can diffuse the situation. Uh, when we call you out, often we want to hear that you recognize the issue at hand, that you recognize that you were wrong. Um, and so be educate yourself, and not just yourself, but your staff and your customers and your supporters 
So yourself, that's great. It means that you obviously were embarrassed and it's easy to educate yourself. Um, but if you are a business owner or you are the lead of, a, of an organization, you want to make sure that that embarrassment doesn't happen again. And not just the embarrassment, but the wrongdoing to the people. And I think that's the most important. Sometimes people are like, I was so embarrassed. And I, <laughs> I tend to not have too much empathy because I'm like, well, you've been called in so many times, how else were you able to understand? And your embarrassment isn't as hard as what the person is uh, facing in terms of their experience. Uh, so definitely encourage your, or not just encourage, educate your staff um, in terms of why was that wrong in the first place. Uh, and your customers and supporters, especially if it's on social media, I see so many times that supporters or customers or clients or members, whenever that apology is made, will come in um, and say, oh my gosh, you don't have to apologize. It's not up to you. There's a lot of gaslighting that could happen. Um, and so it's important that if you are recognizing the mistake, make sure that your followers also recognize that mistake. And if you have to respond to every single person that's telling you you weren't wrong, especially if they're white <laughs> and it wasn't their experience in the first place to comment on, use that time to educate people. Uh, don't do it again. That's plain and simple. Don't. Um, you know, our experience is not a game. Um, our experience is not a joke. Uh, and recognize the hurt that happens when people get uh, called out. It's not just for fun. It's because people are hurt, because people are saying, we can't take it any longer. Uh, be honest and realistic with your capabilities to learn and fix the issue. I like to say that because uh, sometimes I see, you know, apologies and they'll be like, yes, we recognize our mistake, but then they'll do the mistake again. And it's like, you weren't actually honest, you were just trying to fix it so that people can talk about something else. Um, or realistic, where people say, we will absolutely change within tomorrow. Well, a lot of those actions require organizational change and structure and policies. And if it's well done and with intentions, it's not going to get done tomorrow. Um, so make sure that you have that accountability measure um, that is, as any, any person would say, with smart, um, but that is, you know, that has that time limit um, and that is honest and that is realistic within the capabilities that you have. Uh, a call out requires a public response and public accountability. And I want to say that because I've seen even locally in the territory places that, again, will not mention names, not for today, uh, but that have been called out. And then their response is, we are so sorry this has happened. We will be accountable, but we won't tell you accountability. And so as people who are racialized, we're like, well, what was the point of the call out? And how do I know you're going to fix the issue and not do it again if I don't know and I'm not proven that you're going to fix the mistake, that you actually understand and that the fixing of the mistake isn't based on your needs, but at the, of the people's needs who called it out. So if you're being called out, you know, and you apologize and you do all these steps, um, make sure that people who are in the public know what the accountability process is. Ah. So when you're being called in, uh, address the issue and apologize. I think it's a, the same thing. Uh, ask the person or the group how they hope to see the situation addressed. So keep in mind these folks took, and I'm going into D here, but they took the time and effort to call you in. Um, those are hard conversations to be had and recognize that they were mindful of you and your experiences and your emotions when really they didn't have to. Um, so don't be afraid to say thank you for bringing it up to me. You know, even if you don't understand the issue at hand right away, ask them, how would you like this to be fixed? Um, and recognize also that sometimes the situation and how they like it to be fixed goes into extremes that you might not have thought of. Goes into the, well, I need you to not be in that position of power anymore. I need you to step down. I need you to fire this person who might be your best employee, but your best employee is racist. Um, and so, you know, those are not... Um, 
The, the accountability is not for your comfort, uh, but again, they're for the, the well-being of the people who are calling, calling them out or calling them in. Um, include the person and the group in your accountability process. Uh, that could also look like asking them you know, what, not just what you'd like to see, but how would you like to see it implemented? Um, and I, the accountability process that I've seen most succeed is when the people who I've called out have been involved every step of the way uh, and that there's a follow-up. It's not just, great, thank you, uh, I will do it, but then you never hear back. Uh, but there's a, let's come back to it in one month. And we have these landmarks and we know, okay, by this time, I was supposed to educate myself, take this course, I was supposed to fire this person, this has happened. By this time, I was supposed to do X, Y, and Z follow up with that person. And even if that accountability process, let's say was within a year, come back to it the year after. You know, you wanna make sure you don't repeat it. Um, make sure that the change that you're bringing is sustainable um, and that you're not in the same position all over again. Ah, my favorite. Uh, racialized people's reactions, whether they're angry, um, whether they say language that you might not approve of, um, whether it's tearful, whatever their reaction is, uh, know that they're valid and they're warranted. Uh, it takes a lot to call people out, but it also takes a lot to experience these things, right? Those are experiences that you yourself might never, and I'm, I'm saying you, keeping in mind that I'm talking to a white audience, you yourself will never go through these experiences. No matter how many movies you may watch, no matter how many books you may read, these experiences are ours. They're very specific, um, and the person is really bringing themselves um, in, a, in a position of vulnerability and recognize that it's not about you. Um, white tears and white fragility is not valid and is not warranted and know the difference. Um, so what do I mean by white tears? I literally mean white tears. <laughs> um, people who, uh, and I see smiles in the room, um, you've probably seen it before, people who start to cry. Right? You're telling someone, and especially racialized people, will say, hey, this wasn't right, or I don't feel comfortable, and that person feels so attacked with their emotions, they start to cry. And what happens is that we're no longer you know, talking about the issue at hand. We're now focusing all our energy on your tears and your issue, when really that wasn't the, the, the subject in the first place. Um, White tears doesn't always have to be tears. Uh, it can happen with people walking away, right? You're having a conversation and suddenly somebody gets up and leaves. Um, it could be playing the victim. You know, I can't believe you told me this. Me, Deborah, how could you, Paige? I'm Deborah. We like our kids play together. Um, there, or it could be the empty threats. So, of course, you would say this. Uh, you just think I should quit, right? So, what? I should quit. Um, and sometimes when I, when I'm faced with white tears, I'm not the best person. I have to say it. I am not the best person. Um, I'm not the one um, to be seen with with someone with white tears because especially empty threats people will say of course you think I should quit and my reaction is well quit you know if this was something that you're thinking of I didn't bring it up what I was trying to do was educate you what I was trying to do is show you that there's a problem that it's fixable and so if this is too much for you maybe you're not in the best position to take on other issues. And if this is too much for you to take on, imagine all the other issues that are coming up. Um, so yeah, empty threats might come with someone like me who's like, good, act on it. You know, ch I challenge you, go for it. White fragility, a little bit of the same thing, but it's that defensive mode. Um, and white people, I have to say, you get very defensive when we're talking about race. Um, it's, ooh, there's a little feedback. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I'll say it again, just because there was feedback. White people, when we're talking about race, you get defensive. Um, it gets into, it looks like gaslighting, right? Um, so things like, let's say I call you out, and then people will say, oh my God, you're so sensitive. 
you're so paranoid, uh, it was just a joke, um, it's because uh, you don't know me, uh, it could come out as passive aggressive or fakeness. Uh, I love this sentence that I get sometimes is, I understand where you're coming from. And sometimes I'm like, you clearly don't understand where I'm coming from, because if so, we wouldn't be in this conversation in the first place. So what do you mean by I understand where you're coming from? Uh, it could also look like affirm uh, affirming other white people. Um, or sorry, it, it could also come as affirmation from other white people. So uh, let's say I'm in a meeting, Deborah starts crying. Um, usually the place is very white. And so uh, Stacy comes in and says, oh, Deborah, I'm so sorry you had to go through this. Um, or you were rational, but they weren't. And we hear it often with a lot of times when we're talking about white fragility, this, this idea or this concept that it's not rational um, to bring up these issues. It's not okay. It's not the right moment or it's not the right way. Um, I appreciate you. You've been so good to me. So you're not the bad person. Uh, again, these times when we do call you out or call you in, it's not about you. And that's really important to, to recognize. Um, and please don't make joke or fun of the situation. Um, I could give you examples. If you look at you know any CBC article, whenever it talks about race, you will have the five, six bozos that will be like, oh my gosh, it was just a joke, get over it. Again, our experiences are not jokes. <laughs> this, is, this is the anxieties that we go through every day. Um, and if we can understand that COVID brings on anxiety, I think we can understand that racial injustice also brings on anxieties. Um, yeah, okay. This is my favorite because I'm sure people who are Yukoners will go, oh my God, Paige went there. I love situations like this because um, they happen in real life. And I like to think any moment is a teachable moment. So if ever there's somebody from GNP that's on the call and you think it was unwarranted, know that this is an educational moment. Know that I'm not trying to be petty. Um, and if I was, it wouldn't come out like this. But I think for anybody else who doesn't know, A, recognize that you can be in my PowerPoint next time. Um, so thank you for the content, but be recognized that you will make mistakes and it's important that we need to learn from it. So um, I will not read the language that is uh, on the screen uh, because they actually used uh, ableist language, <laughs> um, but I will give the context. So uh, GNP is a pizza pizzeria in Whitehorse um, and they wanted to give out free pizza. Um, and one of their ways of client engagement which we will go to in the next slide. Um, but one of the ways they wanted to engage their clients was to start this campaign, um, the We Love Karens. Uh, and it pretty much addresses uh, the term uh, Karen um, and saying, you know, we love the Karens so much that we will give them free pizzas. Uh, we have to talk about where that language came from. So again, remember when I was talking about language, know the language you are using. Um, I wish that they had done a Google search um, or that they would have known that the term Karen um, was coined by black people to, uh, to dish out our experience and saying, when we get followed in stores or when we are managers ourselves or when we are in positions of power, we are challenged and it's not okay. And sometimes we are challenged, sometimes often, we are challenged for reasons that are unwarranted. Um, and so black people coined the term Karen. Um, a little irony about this with me is that uh, back in the 90s, the term was actually called page. There were lots of pages. Um, and you knew exactly what we talked about. Uh, it's a name. Yes, it's a way for black people to find humor in our pains, <laughs> but also saying we need to stop this. We need to stop the, the Karens or the Stacys or the Felicias or the Barbs and Judys, etc. But this pizzeria decided to talk about the Karens. So you can imagine what happened. Uh, racialized people were like, 
excuse me, that's not going to happen. You can't just give out pizza to white people without actually addressing the anti-blackness in, in what the situation is. Um, and again, I'll let you read uh, their statement. But to give you an idea, uh, it didn't actually happen right away like this. So first, the post was on, um, and then we, as racialized people, we noticed that every time a racialized person would say, this is not okay, their comment would be deleted. Um, and that was really interesting because it's like, why are you silencing us? Again, we are calling you out by saying, this is not okay. We are educating you and saying, what you're doing is wrong. You might want to reconsider this, this, this goal that you have. On the other hand, you had a lot of white Karens that were like, thank you so much. I'm here to claim my free pizza without actually understanding the context in which why it's infuriating racialized people and understandably mostly, and mostly black people. So um, they deleted uh, the post. Um, I got really quick on it, I did a screenshot, uh, but then they recognized their error and they issued a statement. So when we're talking about callout, you know, the second phase to the callout is recognizing your error and apologize. So you can read that they've apologized. Maybe we'll leave it for like five seconds. And then next slide, they're still apologizing, so that's good. And then next slide. And this is what I want to focus on. So they've issued their statement, they apologized, um, but remember I was talking about, you know, do apologize with intentions. Uh, and so if ever, again, if ever people from GMP is on the call, or if ever the Olivia Pope who wrote this is on the call, if they had a communication strategist to do this or not, this is not me um, attacking your work, but this is me uh, showing what we can talk, what concrete actions can come out of a public apology. Um, so the first thing that we see is owners and management are going to educate themselves about the experiences of our brothers and sisters of color. I'm going to stop here. Um, so first off, recognize that it was an anti-black <laughs> racist uh, event. Uh, and so black people are not people of color. Uh, so use language that is specific. And when you're educating yourself, educate yourself in terms of who exactly did you offend. Uh, they could have also, um, we're talking about the gender binary. Uh, there's a lot of brothers and sisters. Um, be mindful of how racialized people use those terms, right? If somebody's white and comes up to me and says, hey, my sister, I look at them and go, ooh, ooh, what? Well, no, we, I don't know you like that. Um, and also, so not everybody are brothers or sisters. So they could have easily said the folks um, who are black, indigenous, and people of color, or racialized as well. Uh, this will include steps of educating ourselves through re uh, regularly watching APTN. I, I'm pausing on this <laughs> because when I read this, I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of awkward. You kind of outed yourself for not supporting APTN in the first place. But also, what's the intention of watching APTN? So you're watching news. That's like me pretty much saying, hey, I'm sorry I offended white people. I'm going to watch CBC News. You're not actually addressing the issue, right? So when you say you're watching APTN um, and understanding indigenous perspective, again, this was an anti-black statement. You can't fix anti-blackness by supporting or by fixing anti-indigeneity. So understand what the issue was at hand. And I'm sure if somebody was there, either a black staff <laughs> or someone who was knowledgeable, could have easily told them, hey, this is an anti-black moment, right? So you can't combat one race with another race's issue, or race, I should say, ethnicity or identity. Um, so understand, or sorry, go into what's the intention. What's the intention of watching APTN? 
Um, so, okay, you're going to support APTN, great, sure. Um, and reading the works of anti-racist scholars, which is good, which is great, read the books, but also recognize that um, not just scholars can talk about anti-racism and anti-black racism. Right? There's lots of activists that are doing so many posts, so many moments, so many stories about anti-black racism. So yes, as much as supporting the scholars is good, it's great, it's you recognizing that we do have scholars. Also recognize that not everybody can achieve that, that, that stature of being scholars. Um, that sometimes education happens in a public way. And what I mean by public is um, you know, people who can't access the academia or that title. Uh, it, does a, it does happen on the ground. We'll be contributing mini pizzas to the organizations. Good, good job. Uh, we won't repeat this mistake. I like that. <laughs> it's good that I know that you told me, um, but it could be more. How do I know that you won't repeat this mistake? Right? How do I know that your intentions is not just to say, again, we're going to write this statement, nobody's going to talk about it again, because we're going to say we're sorry and it's fine. Um, and so things that they could have added um, is how are they not going to repeat this mistakes? You know, how do they know that they fully understand that, of course, they're not going to talk about Karens. I'm sure whoever made that post will never talk about a Karen ever again. But how do I know you're not going to use Stacy next time? Or you're not going to use words like, that was lit. Or you're not going to do something that's culture appropriative. I want to know exactly how I can hold you accountable. Um, I also want to know when. So we won't repeat this mistake tomorrow, but it's going to come back again. We won't repeat this mistake next year. How do I know that you are recognizing there's a, there's a change in your culture and in your work culture that needs to happen? So something they could have added is we won't repeat this mistake. We will be uh, you know, uh, making sure that there's mandatory trainings for our staff, for our owners, for our managers, and for our patrons. Because if you go on that post, and I do encourage you, I always encourage people to, to look on Facebook um, because the content is there. Do look at that post, and especially the apology, because the apology is still there. Look at the customers and how they're engaging. And a lot of that engagement is gaslighting. A lot of it's, I can't believe you're writing this. You didn't have to be in this situation in the first place. Um, you have Karens that are in town that are saying, oh, well, I'm a Karen and I wasn't offended and I still want my pizza. You have other people that are saying, well, I can't believe you wrote the statement, so I'm going to call the manager. How do you think it, we feel when we see the statement, but we don't see you actually educating the people who are your clients? Um, and so those are ways that you can demonstrate, if it happens to you, that you are really supporting the statement, you are backing up the, sp the statement that you're making, and that you are here to change the culture. Um, Another thing they could have written um, is, we're going to hire more BIPOC people at the management level. Straight up, that would have been like, OK, great. You understand that you have a lot of racialized people on the front line, but in the management area where, you know, again, that power dynamic is that equity isn't there, um, you could have easily said, we're going to hire BIPOC people uh, just to make sure that when we're talking about not repeating this mistake, we have some somebody who can call us back in and say, hey, you're about to make the same mistake you made two weeks ago or last year. Um, and finally, an action plan would have been great. Um, and I'm seeing more of action plan. The word accountability and transparency are words that uh, sometimes I go, oh my god, here we go again with these words, um, because sometimes they're just words and I don't actually see the action plan and I don't actually see how me as a racialized person, I could hold you accountable. And that at the end of the day, not just the apology, I want to make sure I'm not going to be flustered once and for all. Or, sorry, again. Um, and so an action plan would have been great. So starting tomorrow, we are shutting down our office, or sorry, we are shutting down our business because we obviously need to educate ourselves, right? 
Great. Um, we are also going to educate our clients because we are recognizing with this thread that a lot of people in Whitehorse need to learn what anti-black racism is. So we will offer free pizza to have this workshop. Um, let's face it, a lot of people who come just like this workshop today, a lot of you already know concepts of anti-racism um, and are most likely not the ones that we need to grab and do the whole education for. Um, and this could have been a really great opportunity for them to go reach the people who won't sign up to the, to, the, to the lectures and the webinars. As much as I'm confident in my public speaking skills, I know I don't reach everybody. This could have been that moment where they're saying, we will educate you because we recognize a social change needs to happen. And then, of course, with time, um, they could have also said, you know, we recognize that we don't have the, the racialized people to talk to us about anti-racism. They could have had a town hall or a consultation. There are many ways, and I'm going to go into that next, but there are many ways that you can engage people when we're talking about anti-racism. So thank you, GNP, if you're on the call. Um, and I hope that you do number three and you will not repeat this mistake again. So client engagement. So again, I'm talking about clients, but I'm also talking about customers and I'm also talking about membership. Um, so how do you engage your clients? And this is a question I have for you. How do you engage your clients or your people beyond the obvious? We're talking about small business. Um, you know, the business is pretty obvious. I'm a soap maker. I need you to come and buy my soap. Um, but when you're looking at organizations, how do you engage them that is not the obvious mission statement? How do you engage them in the fight for combating racism? Um, which clients do you draw in and for what purpose? So I like to say you're the company you keep, but you're also the company you bring in. Uh, and now with social media, we get to see which of our friends is liking you and supporting you. We get to see which groups you are supporting. Um, why are you drawing them in? And sometimes that could be a question of, hey, we just noticed we're, we're drawing in a certain type of clientele. Um, either A, we need to educate them, or B, we need to reframe where we're at in terms of our, is our, of our business, because obviously we're not attracting the clientele that we want. And I love Janet Jackson. I had to put her in there. Um, but as a black person, I always say, especially if you're doing acts of allyship, I always say, what have you done for me lately? Um, again, you're asking me to support your business. Why would I support you if you are either not supporting my people or not supporting the people who look like me? Yeah, so engagement can come in uh, many, many ways. Be creative. Right? Social media, through donation, through education, through offer of space, through pop-ups. Uh, we are in this era, especially COVID, where uh, pop-ups are a thing. Um, and you can collaborate with either a business, especially if you're just starting, collaborate with a more established business and say, you know what, today we will have a pop-up education space. You know, we are a coffee, we usually do coffees, um, but today we are giving out free coffee for you to come learn about anti-racism and anti-black racism or anti-indigenous racism. Um, offer your space, it doesn't always have to be about money as much as, you know, we'd all love to be rolling in the, in the I was gonna say Wilfred Laurier, but no, we do not wanna be rolling in that guy, but <laughs> we all want money at some point. Um, but sometimes recognizing that your business does not have the money and the financial gains to do so, there are other ways you can offer support. If you have a space, there are so many grassroots organizations that are doing the work that could utilize that space for a meeting. Um, if you notice a logo doesn't look that great and you know what a vector is and you're like, I could see the background, offer, reach out and say, hey, I actually do graphic designing. I can support you. I'm just noticing this thing. And most likely the, the people or the group will be like, thank you for coming to me. Um, donations, but also call of donations, you know, in terms of your clients and customers, there's a way that you could say, you know, we are, do, I'm a soap maker, again, um, I have all these amazing soaps, but these specific soaps 
this will go for this specific cause. Um, uh, we, in the summer when we were just starting, I'm saying we as Northern Voices Rising, we had um, a baker, uh, the landed baker, who was saying, I am, pro I am uh, participating in Bakers Against Racism. I'm gonna go to the market on Thursday. I know my bread is gonna sell, and true, the, that bread sold in like two minutes. And um, it was like, I would love for all that money for that specific bread to go to you folks, because I understand you're just starting. We didn't have a logo. We still don't have a logo. This is how grassroots we are. But we didn't even have like means to get that money. But we're like, this is amazing. We have somebody who recognizes our work. We didn't even get to the full work that we can do and our full potential. But you are reaching out to us. This is amazing. Of course, we will support you because you're supporting us and you're supporting the work. Um, so find ways that are, that are engaging to your clients um, and customers. Um, your, like I said, your clients and your supporters will be a reflection of your business. So if you are being called out on social media and you are muting the racialized voices, we notice these things. And if people are like me, we screenshot these things. Um, so be mindful of, you know, do you mute that conversation and that person? Or do you take that time to have an educational moment? and say, hey, thank you. I'm really humble that you're, you're sharing this with me. Um, often I've seen businesses see call outs as an attack to their business and it's the, I'm gonna retaliate, retaliate. You know, you said this, I'm not only gonna meet you, but I'm gonna send you a private message and I'm gonna sue you. Uh, we're in Canada, when you sue people, it doesn't happen that way. I don't know about the States, but here it doesn't go anywhere. So stop having this defensive mechanism and recognize what people are calling you out for. Which brings to my third point. Um, sometimes people will say, well, those are small voices. Um, and are small voices, A, recognize why? their small voices, right? Um, like I said, racialized people, it takes a lot for us to be vulnerable, to put ourselves out there. We know that we're gonna get attacked when we do call you out, um, but these small voices speak volumes, right? And it's important that we're heard and it's important that you validate what we're telling you. All right, so social innovation. Um, before I go into social innovation, I just wanted to really briefly uh, from my notes, in terms of being called out, uh, other ways that you can, you know, talk uh, publicly, especially when it's public, address your calling out. Um, yes, you could put out a public statement, uh, but sometimes it is having that tough conversation of, okay, this was a scandal in the media. Do we respond by having a press conference? And sometimes it will need that. Do we have to rebrand who we are? Do we have to fire the best employee? You know, how do we keep accountable because people from the public are waiting? Um, and like I said with time, uh, sometimes it could also be a town hall and a consultation. Um, just be mindful whenever you respond in the public, <laughs> Uh, encourage the people who were most affected um, to have a space to speak, to have a space to say, to speak their minds. And it might mean, I, I know I just said don't mute people, but it might mean muting the majority, which is the white majority, if you see gaslighting happening. Um, and town halls, yes, they will get in uncomfortable. Yes, consultations, you will hear things that you probably didn't want to hear. Or sometimes I hear it often, people say, well, why now? Why would you say this now? Sometimes it's that time, it's that opportunity with callouts that we have because it's like we were trying to tell you this, this, you know, back in 2012, but now the focus is back on you and I know I have solidarity and now is the time I'm gonna be able to come out. So if people start bringing things up from the past, A, it should tell you that you haven't changed your, your behavior and that's huge. Uh, and B, it's again, not an attack on you, but it's recognizing that there's a pattern that needs to be addressed. Okay, so social innovation. Uh, I want to put that there because uh, a lot of times people say we want to be anti-racist, but we can't. We just can't. We don't have the means. We don't have the people. We don't have the education. And I'm thinking if we were able to change for COVID within one month, 
you know, we are able to change our racist mind frames. Um, the question is not whether or not you can, the question is whether or not you want to. And it requires a bigger effort. Um, with COVID, we're talking a lot about supporting local and acting local. Uh, that goes with anti-racism too. Uh, yes, you can support the global Black Lives Matter movement, that's great. Absolutely, I would never say no to that. But recognize the anti-blackness that is happening in your own neighborhood, and sometimes it's your own neighbor. Uh, having those conversations is really important, um, and you can do it, you know, sometimes those conversations are not easy, like I mentioned, but you could do it in a creative mindset. So think outside the box uh, for all matters related to your business. Uh, so budget, I talked about it last week, but in your budget, uh, you know, maybe it means maybe i encourage you to have either a solidarity line or uh we'll see in the next slides not yet but we'll see how other businesses were uh were innovative in terms of the money that they received and the revenue that they received and how do they give back locally uh it could mean collaborations uh i'm thinking you know there's some businesses that do collaborate. Some, there's something that happened in Whitehorse over COVID was uh, a lot of the chefs collaborated to create a collective. Uh, those are wicked times that you can collaborate. I think with COVID, we are now in the mindset of we can do things together. I mean, that was the whole marketing framework of COVID is that we're in this together. Well, we can be in this together in combating racism. Um, and your client reach, you know, like I said, on social media is a great way to find your clients, but it could also mean in your newsletters, it could also mean when they're coming in in person, um, having those discussions and the discussions that are, that are tailored and specific. Um, so, uh, the other way, you know, when we're talking about supporting local and anti-racism, keep in mind intersectionalities. So, uh, you can support, uh, you know, sorry, what I, where I'm going with this is not just intersectionalities, but have an anti-oppressive framework. So how are you reaching your clientele that are disabled or variously abled? Um, when we're talking about affordability, recognize that racism also goes with <laughs> the economy and how the economy has a huge impact on, uh, has a racialized impact. Um, you know, housing, here in Whitehorse, we have a huge housing crisis. And a lot of that housing crisis affects racialized people. How can you as a business support racialized people that are seeking housing? Uh, strike efforts, I wouldn't be a labor activist if I wouldn't mention one strike that is happening in Canada. Um, so folks who don't know or may know, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador right now, there is the Dominion grocery strike, uh, sorry, Domi Dominion grocery workers that are on strike uh, because Dominion is part of President's Choice, it's part of Blah Blah, um, and we know is a part of of Galen Weston's beautiful babies. Um, but as much as we called them essential workers, their employer removed their $2 pandemic pay. Could we talk about this for a second? $2 um, when they weren't even making $15 an hour. Uh, so yes, shout out to the strikers, but how can you as a business support people that are on the picket lines in a time that's about to be even more crucial because we're talking about winter, we're talking about Thanksgiving. Um, how are you giving back to the people who are in need, who are local? Uh, strikes is really is a really good time. Uh, last week I talked about commemorating uh, events or days. Uh, you know, December 6th is one that we always remember, uh, but for some reason we never remember January 29th. 2017, and that was the day that um, a lot of, there were six Muslim men that were attacked in Quebec, and that was huge. And for some reason, it's not a national remembrance. And so for the Muslim folks that are local, how are you supporting, uh, how are you supporting them? How are you making sure that, yes, we're talking about anti-racism, but we're also talking about Islamophobia that's happening here, you know, in the territory or in Ontario or, on Turtle Island. Uh, so racism doesn't always have to be the hot speaking of the flavor of the month, the Black Lives Matter, because racism happens to a lot of people. Uh, 
sometimes it means refreshing exist existing models. So bursary funds, food drives, uh, the groundwork. Uh, I like to say check out your local activists because your local activist is the one who's doing the groundwork with so many limited resources and is forced to be creative, is forced to be socially innovative. Uh, so if you're not too sure, check out what was done in the past, um, what different strike actions were done in the past and find a way to remodel it in a way that your business can move forward or your organization can do a little bit of the same things. Um, and this is specifically for racialized business owners, um, the very few that are on this call, but we need to talk about supporting each other. Uh, this is really important because uh, as much as maybe racism isn't affecting you right now, but it it is only a matter of time. Um, and. I, the, the example I like to use is my parents came down uh, to Whitehorse uh, through their first time and my mom had seen the, I think it's uh, up north or north of, up north, right? That's in the, in, the, in the airplane. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, Auntie Antoinette's restaurant. And I was about to tell her what the restaurant was all about. She's like, you don't need to tell me. It's a black woman. It's a sister. We're going to go support. I love that because it's like, great, we are here to support each other. But if you are a racialized business owner, uh, there are so many, especially this year, there are so many racialized business owners that are just starting. Um, I'm thinking of Anne's Dumplings. I'm thinking of the folks that um, created the Indian food truck. You know, reach out to them. And if you have to create a support network and say, hey, let's create a collective to see how we can support each other. Maybe we do that chef collaboration from time to time. Maybe we talk about issues that are about to happen or have happened in the past. Find ways to find each other, support each other, um, and really you're uplifting your community. So a couple examples. Social innovation, like I said, it doesn't always have to be about specifically what your business does, right? If you're a baker, yes, there are ways that you could find ways through your artistry um, to, to support uh, anti-racist um, uh, actions. Uh, but I wanted to use this example, um, and I'm sure if you folks can read, um, if you can, of course, but uh, the example is there's a few business owners in Ottawa uh, who decided that they were going to teach their workers uh, de-escalation tactics for people in distress. And this came out of, in 2016, there was a black man named Abdi Rahman Abdi who was in Bridgehead uh, coffee shops, which anybody who's been in Ottawa knows Bridgehead. They're like the place you get your coffee. Um, this man was in distress. Uh, and the workers called 911 because that's usually what people do uh, without recognizing that 911, again, like I said last week, is not the way to assure security for racialized people. 911 actually leads to our death, which sadly was the case for Abdi Rahman Abdi. And of course, that created uh, a huge momentum around the conversation. Um, it was right in the heat of Black Lives Matter movement. And so obviously people were talking about it, were more sensitive to it. Um, there was a boycott. I still boycott Bridgehead Coffee because of the response when they were called out. Um, but these uh, workers, and most of them are small business owners, I'd like to point that out, um, said, you know what, obviously we need to rethink how we deal with people um, that are in distress. And I say deal, that's not the best, the best term I could use. How we come to support people that are in distress. How we come to realize that security for one person doesn't look like the same security for racialized people. Um, and so these are ways that you, yes, um, just to give you a, give a, a little bit of their business, so you have, um, folks from Little Joe uh, Berry's Bakery. It's a vegan bakery in Ottawa. You have Gong Fu Bao, you have Venus Envy. Uh, you'll notice I'm very supportive of Venus Envy. There they are again. Um, you know, you have Bread by Us. When I'm reading this, Mushu Ice Cream, when I'm reading this, I'm like, next time I go to Ottawa, this is who I want to support. 
because I know that I'm welcome in your space. And this is a way for me to understand without seeing the website and the land acknowledgement or however they present themselves, I know that I can go there and I can trust them because there's a certain understanding and there's certain actions that they're doing. Uh, so check it out. You can Google it. It was in the Ottawa Citizen. You can reach out to those business owners and ask them, hey, what does this de-escalation tactics look like? Um, and you can implement it in your own business. And again, with support, um, you know, either racialized or non-racialized, you can call them and say, we would like to implement this in Whitehorse. What does that look like? And the way they're doing it might not be the same for Whitehorse because let's face it, Ottawa and Whitehorse are not the same city, uh, but you can tailor it and create a collective of other small business owners um, or other organizations to make sure that that is in place. And that's another way uh, that you are changing the culture uh, of your workspace. Another example, I'm coming back local. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you probably can't see the writing, uh, but I do wanna use Triple J's as an example. So Triple J's is a collective. They have a can of space, a music uh, space, uh, piercing, tattoos, they're doing rad stuff. Uh, but just recently they released their community investment fund. And something I want to precise about this community investment fund is they're not just giving out money to charities or to non-for-profits, but also, and I quote, passionate groups taking initiatives to make a difference. And those passionate groups are grassroots folks like Northern Voices Rising um, or other groups that, again, might not have the resources, but that will need that support, whether financial um, or other ways as well. I'm sure Triple J's could, could support locally. Um, and so when we're thinking of how do you uh, help local, I love that they wrote, um, you know, people that are, they're looking for people or groups that are supporting youth, environment, education, animal welfare, and the arts. Uh, very Yukon, <laughs> where you have to add your arts and animal welfare. I think that's, that's pretty much us. Uh, but I love that they're going out and saying it, we're not specifically supporting a group that has a specific mandate. We are also looking for people who have, uh, you know, education could be a really big one and it could be really broad. So if you are doing a community investment fund um, or any types of fund, uh, see how you can find ways to support people who don't usually get support. So yes, charities and not-for-profit societies, I've talked about it last week, they get a lot of support, a lot of government support. Yes, reach out to them, but feel free to reach out to the groups that you're seeing are doing the work. The other thing too about the community investment fund is you have to uh, apply, um, which is good. It's not, I, I've seen it, <laughs> it's not too demanding, but recognize that some groups, sometimes the application process might turn them off. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's a competition. I'm never gonna get in, or they're most likely gonna look for specific people. Why? Because we know that the, the that whole framework around grants application can be very exhausting for people. Uh, so sometimes it could also be just reaching out and saying, hey, can we put your name into this box? And we will do the, the advocating on your behalf. Maybe we have your language from a website or from Facebook. We wanna make sure we use the proper language. Uh, we don't wanna appropriate your language, but can we see that we could support you? And doing that extra work will go a long way for people who might not have the same resources as a not-for-profit or as a charity. I'm bringing it back to Venus Envy, my old stomping ground. Um, Venus Envy had a bursary fund. And when I had started there, uh, what I was really drawn to at the time, I was a student union activist, uh, where we advocated a lot around uh, lower and free tuition fees, recognizing that tuition fees are a huge barrier um, for many, many folks, especially racialized people, um, especially folks of marginalized groups. Um, uh, and working at Venus Envy was really exciting for me because I was like, my work can support somebody's access to education and post-secondary education. Uh, and that's just what Venus Envy did. Uh, and what was really neat, a, a couple things that I wanna point out. So when you go to their website, uh, you would notice 
that it said the Venus Anniversary Fund, where it came from. Uh, you notice the language that they use, and often they would say, uh, you know, we are here for uh, in in the mind frame of anti-racism and anti-oppression. Um, they've also would say. In this one, in history and values, Venus Envy intends to be anti-oppressive and anti-racist. We believe that all forms of oppression are acts of violence and that racism, classism, ableism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, whorephobia, and other forms of oppression are used to violate and control members of our communities. I love that because he was like, okay, this is specific. You understand oppression, not just in the flavor of the month, like I keep saying, but you understand that it comes in various forms. You understand that various identities and maybe even intersection identities won't have access to education. Education, excuse me. Um, Horophobia is one that I, I super got focused on when I had started because I had never heard of a group that is sex work positive. And that was huge. I was like, what? We're talking about sex work. We're talking about a, the validity of sex work, but also how sex workers are marginalized and can't access education. And you're going to support sex workers in town. Ottawa is a town that has a lot of sex work. Uh, and I was really happy that as Venus Envy, we were able to provide education or access to education to folks that aren't often represented. So when you are, let's say you are doing a bursary fund, find the people that aren't often found and aren't often talked about. Um, because chances are a lot of the you know, other forms of uh, the uh, identities will have support. We are in that time when we're talking about gender equity. Um, right now, everyone loves to talk about LG the LGBTQ2S. You hear it all the time as a monolith. Uh, but there are people that face oppression that aren't often talked about. And those are the people that deserve a platform and deserve to be heard and deserve to be supported as well. Oh, and sorry, go back. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, before my big face blows up. But uh, the Ottawa program, uh, I just wanted to throw that out there because many people might say, well, how do I do that? How do I find ways to get money that's not just a GoFundMe? At Venus Envy, uh, we threw parties, which was obviously a pre-COVID time, uh, but there were raffles, there were also uh, local events and donations. So again, that, that idea of social innovation, sometimes it's just taking something that's very basic like a picnic, remix it, um, and put it with your business twist. Um, the Venus Envies were the best. I, hands down, I, anybody who wants to challenge me, you can challenge me on it. Uh, but what was really neat about the Venus Envy dance parties is they brought community in. And other people, I think anybody you talk to has a great experience with Venus Envy because not just the store was non-judgmental, it was a great environment, but we also saw how they bring back, how they bring community together and how they give back to community. So those are ways that you can, again, take an idea, remix it, um, and find ways to be anti-racist with it. Okay, so this is the end. Um, I. Would love to hear online questions, comments. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's start with a comment from Catherine. Uh, and we didn't have many questions come in throughout the talk. So this is just a reminder to people that now is the time to ask questions. And we'll read them out. Um, but we'll start with this comment from Catherine from uh, enchantnetwork.ca. Yeah. Um, this came up while you were talking about the Triple J Investment Fund. Right. Catherine writes, good example, I love that investment fund giving money to non-incorporated grassroots groups instead of only giving to charities and nonprofits. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Ashate, I notice you folks are also going through a change. I've noticed, I noticed these things. Uh, I'm really excited. They actually did a call out for BIPOC and queer trans BIPOC people uh, in terms of how to bring in an anti-racist framework. So I will bring back the shout out to you, Catherine, and your group. Um, check out what they're doing in terms of their accountability measures. Uh, we also had a comment from the Yukon Pride Center. Uh, they unfortunately had to leave early, but just wanted to say, great work, Paige. Thanks Aww. for all this, uh, for this great workshop. Thank you. 
Okay, no other comments on the stream. Uh, if anybody in the room has any questions, oh. I can come around with a mic. Let's do it, yeah. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I just, um, two things that I noted that I thought were like very impactful. The first thing was your point about COVID, how quickly mm. the entire world, how we act, what we do can change. Yeah. Because we want, we saw the value, right? Mm -hmm. And we wanted to, and that really stood out to me uh, because yeah, you're right. If we really wanted to do these things, they can happen really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, the, I really, really love the example of the fund too. And your great examples about how businesses can, can work in really unique ways and to be mindful of, um, the grassroots organizations and the people really doing the work. Yeah. So I think it's a good reminder to look, you know, more broadly and to really be aware of, of who's out there and what they're doing and, mm -hmm. and then consider, you know, like for, for us, it's, we have space mm -hmm. and we're always so open to working with groups that might not be able to afford access to space and you yeah. know, it's a good reminder that we can do more to connect and to um, put that out there yeah and let people know so, thank you so thank you if i could add to that in whitehorse last year we saw so many youth climate justice activists come out um youth that would take a break from their school to come out uh, and those were some of the biggest rallies uh, and sometimes people will say well that was a thing and now we don't see them as much ask the questions where are these youth now um, and especially for you construct members like some of you folks are so well, some you're all talented uh, but some of you folks are into woodworking or you know have those skills that youth might not have and so find ways as you know as your as your business especially the folks that do logos or that do promotional items you know how can you support and get that pep back in youth i can tell you that that work is exhausting it's demanding um, and especially if you're in high school sometimes you don't even have the chance to go out free will um, to do actions like this because you can't, you're a youth, you have to be within the certain limitations. Uh, so definitely ha have those questions of where are those folks and activists now and how could we continue that support and maybe even take on some of that work that might be really exhausting. Thanks for adding that. Okay, I think that's it for all the questions. Um, thank you to everyone Sweet. for coming out. Thank you. Um, this is the second part, so if you missed the first one, remember to go back on YouTube and give that a watch. Um, and we're getting a couple of thanks from the stream for Aww, doing this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for showing up. Mm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>